Hey, Back to Back family, it's Beth. And I am so grateful for the ways in which you have invested in orphaned and vulnerable children around the world. You've traveled to sites and shared your time and your resources. And for that, we are so grateful. And today I'm gonna to share with you a little bit about Back to Back's newest site right here in our hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio. We're bringing trauma-competent care principles and holistic care to kids right here in our city. Today I'm gonna to introduce you to Chris Cox. He's Back to Back Cincinnati's director. And he's going to share with you and with me the ins and outs of what's going on right now, right here in this city. Hey! Hi, my friend. How are you? <laughs> Good. Thanks for picking me up. Oh, my pleasure. Are you uh, ready for this? I am. Where are you taking me first? We're going to head down to a, a coffee shop that's owned by one of our current partners in Price Hill. Okay. I can't wait. All right. Let's go. Can you think back to that drive 22 years ago where you and Todd were Packing everything up in, what was that, an Isuzu Trooper? Is that what that was? was yeah. A little bit of a different vehicle today. Yes. And as you were heading down 71, could you have imagined that we would be stopping at a site in Cincinnati? No, I, I couldn't. I, I mean, we, we initially just so fully and wholly heard that call towards the Mexican child that that's, that's really what we drove towards. But it's funny, as as the years went by and as people came to visit us initially just in Monterey and they would have these like one week mission trip experiences that were powerful for them and and ultimately inspirational for them they would report back to us about what they did when they went home like they would either plug into existing ministries in their own city or start ministries in their city and I think that was probably the first kind of awakening to me that God was doing things in every country including the country I was from We just had this laser beam calling towards the Mexican orphan, and it took God maturing us to realize He loves the Mexican family as much as He likes the Mexican orphan, and He likes the Nigerian child as much as He likes the Mexican child. And, and as our understanding of His heart for people grew, then so exponentially did the ministry. Tell me about the importance of collaborating or sharing and doing things together. Uh, What's that mean to you? That means everything to us. I, mean, I think really quickly, um, like as in year one, we realized when we operated in our strengths and shared and um, collaborated with people that were offering their strengths, then we were going to stay in the game longer. There is this drive inside of me to say, let's make a movement. Not I, mm. We don't want to build an organization. We want to create a movement, and that movement isn't going to happen because, you know, we decided to build an organization or start a program. That movement's going to happen when I say, I see what you're doing, and I love what you're doing, and let's figure out how we can to do more of it together. I have found that that feels foreign to a lot of nonprofits. It's really... Um, Sometimes you're fighting over the same resources or you're trying to create something that maybe you feel like you're on an island and you're the only ones doing it. So it it's really allows empathy to enter into the relationship. But also, I also know I can say it without a doubt that if I offer up, this is a collaboration. We're in this with you. How can we help? The leadership of Back to Back is going to be 100% behind me as I say yes. it. I'm saying, no, 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 I offer everything because that's who we are and that's what we do. When I very first started over 20 years ago, I thought the answers were gonna be easy. Like, you have a hungry orphan, you feed them. You have a, someone stuck in generational poverty, you send them on to school. Right. And then I actually fell in love with the kids. And when I fell in love with one of the kids that we serve, I was like, oh, these are the external pressures that I couldn't mm. see with my eyes before. And these are the internal struggles that come from trauma that I didn't experience, so I didn't understand what it was doing. And, and once I began to love the kids that we were coming alongside, then I began to understand why programs and plans, and th those are part of the story. They're absolutely critical parts of the story, but they don't complete the whole story. They're, they're not the whole answer. It's, it's relationship that's missing. That's, that's, what we, um, that's what ties together all the other efforts. <laughs> My favorite I have two favorite coffee spots in the city and this is my top well, on my top two where we're going they so both serve Diet Coke right you don't drink coffee at all I don't very I don't. interesting I know 
I wanted to acquire the taste, but you know what? I have a taste for enough other things that I, I might not work too hard on that one. This is one of my favorite spots in the city. I can actually see it. I've never been here and it's unbelievable. It's become a spot where people who are collaborating around the city come to get coffee with one another or share stories. So it feels like that neighborhood yeah. location and there's a lot of energy here. I, when I walked in just a minute ago, I could overhear a couple conversations and I was realizing that's exactly what was happening. Yeah, I wanted us to start here because we're just a few miles from a couple of our, of our partners here in Price Hill, two of our after school programs meet just, just maybe three miles away. It's a community that we're really starting to invest in as an organization. I know uh, just a, a little over a month ago, you were able to, to come and visit at one of those partnerships and spend some time with us. I mean, and we didn't get to debrief after, so I'm really <laughs> interested. Like, if you think back yeah. to that day, uh, what was one moment or story that stood out to you while we were serving together? Yeah, you did a great job dividing the people that I had brought into like the craft team, the food team, the game team, the outside team. And I found myself gravitating towards this group of teenage boys that were kind of around a video game console. And as, as we began to talk, I started to ask them like about each other, like how to, about how he plays or about how he, and I was trying to invoke or invite a little bit of encouragement or edification amongst them. And as they were kind of bragging on each other, I thought it, it just took an adult in this room to direct this conversation, to take where naturally teenage boys might go, which is competition, yeah. into something that looks more like cooperation. I can see why you're drawn, but tell me just specifically what, what led you to feel like this was the right role for you and this yeah. is the right work for you. Yeah, it's a, um... It's an easy and hard question for me. Um, the easy answer is, for the last 20 years of my life, if, it, if it's been in an effort to give youth who don't have a voice a voice, I mean, that's just the, it's just me. It's, it's what I found is just really the, the motivator in the morning is if, if there's someone who doesn't have a voice and they're an emerging generation, I wanna be part of, of giving them a voice. And then when the opportunity for Cincinnati started to emerge, um, the invitation to do what we were doing globally, locally, was an aha moment for me of saying, yes, please, let's do that. And when you started as a student of Cincinnati, like what were some of the first initial needs that you saw? Over 90% of the students participating in most programs that we partner with are people of color. And almost 99% of the leaders that are inve investing in these programs are Caucasian. And that stood out to me from a, a gap of saying what it looks like to be a part of a program and then a leader in the program. There seems to be a gap here. Could we be part of an answer in that? That was intriguing to me. But then that moved quickly into some heartbreaking environments where I found that there are neighborhoods in this city where the life expectancy is 10 years less than those of the neighborhoods around them. From a disconsent time, I was like, that, I'm, I'm in it's at that okay. point. Like, that's just not okay. It's not okay. That someone's life would be shorter because of the environment and the external influences that are that are coming at them. And then I met a student or two, and I heard their story. And at that point, once I heard a story, it was not. This isn't a statistic. This is now a relationship. Uh, this sounds like the same youth that we've served globally. Let's just give them everything, everything that we have. What are some of the things you guys have already begun to do? Yeah, we, we reached out to other organizations around the city and said, who is offering uh, the same type of care that we want to offer, holistic trauma-informed care? That was really our baseline. And how can we serve them? How can we just be present? And since then, we've been showing up Monday through Thursday at programs for different organizations. We've just been practicing presence with the organizational leaders, kids that are in programs. And when a need comes up and says, can you help? We say yes until we can. And that's really, I mean, that sums up what we've learned over the course of the last 20 years. Like, good work stands on top of connection. Right. That's what, what I'm so excited about your team and the way they pursue connection yes. in this city. I know in the next couple of episodes, you're going to specifically introduce us to some of those folks yeah. and show us places in the city where um, Back to Back has gotten involved yeah. and highlight some of the people that you have met along the way that are making a difference. So I'm looking forward to watching those episodes and yeah. having you introduce to the Back to Back family some of the things that you guys have seen. Well, they are getting ready to meet right now, so we're going to jump back in and, uh, and head down the street to our team meeting. Okay, let's go.
I love that like we're walking into your office essentially like yeah. that you and your team are about to gather right here in this park right out here where everyone is yeah it's pretty amazing we love that we have this uh opportunity to not only serve within the city but to be able to hang out and spend time having conversations within the city so we, we thought early on Let's figure out ways in which to have meetings in fun spaces like this beautiful park. Yeah, where you can feel actually the whole rhythm of the city. Yes, right. I imagine in your staff meetings, you probably share a lot of stories, like reasons why, probably good stories and hard stories, things that keep people going when you have setbacks or struggles or whatever. But tell me one of the good stories that, that just reminds you why it is that this is why wake up and do what you do. Yeah, I'm, I know you'll be surprised to know that it's, it involves a teenager and investing in like a teenager's life because yeah. I, it's so outside of my character, right? <laughs> uh, I love being able to find uh, ways in which to invest in young men and young women yeah. that maybe, maybe gives them a, a voice. And that's the story that really stands out to me now. There was a boy that I met the first time that I was volunteering in this after school programming and he, he was kicked out of within the first five minutes for fighting. Those are my favorite kind. Of <laughs> I know, I'm like, there's my boy right there, let's go. And by the third day, he's kicked out, he, made, he may have made it 20 minutes. So I was really proud of him that day. Uh, by the fourth day, we got to go on a walk together and that started a conversation around his journey. And those walks just became more consistent on a weekly basis and before long, uh, the director of that organization asked if I would be willing to mentor him and one of his friends. And over the last year, we've spent every week going out for a ride and getting some food together and processing his week. And I've, I've heard a lot of hard and um, overwhelming stories from him, but I've seen a lot of hope. And as he shares his story, what we recognize is the fighting stopped. Um, he stopped fighting. He wasn't getting kicked out. And a few months ago, there was the opportunity to go on a leadership retreat. And he came to me and said, the organization hasn't picked me to go on leadership. They said, I'm just not ready for leadership yet. Um, that's really frustrating to me. I'm overwhelmed. I feel like I've come a long way. Yeah. And he was bitter, uh, but he processed it again. And yet uh, a couple of weeks ago, he messaged me and said, guess what? They're leaving for the retreat on Sunday and they invited me to go. So I'm packing my stuff because they asked me to be a leader. And I just love that story of, you know, 18 months ago, the kid who was being sent home five minutes right. for fighting right. is now getting the phone call to say, hey, come lead with us. So I love that, that that story, and it's not over. We're in high school with that kid now, and so he's gonna have a lot of things to overcome. But I just love that there's a safe adult. And he texted me after that and just said, why did you choose me? No one ever chooses me. That's what you want every, every child yeah. to feel like all around the world, that they have been chosen. Yes, and I can't wait until there's a day where there's some kid that's gonna message him that yeah. and say, hey, why did you choose me? No one ever chooses me. And then it's just like that next generation down. Uh, we're gonna drop in on our team meeting and I know you've interacted with our team and, and are excited them. to connect with them again. We wanna introduce the world to this team yeah. because these are the men and women who because they are trauma competent trained and they're coordinating that for us or they are professional coaches that are working on one-on-one -on -one coaching for boys and girls from hard places or some of our team are social workers. We call them family care coordinators because yep. we want to invest in the whole family. Amen. And some of this team, they're, they're in the world of education as our education coordinators. And what we recognize is that having these professionals who see the individual child and want to give them a voice in all of those environments, that's what's really going to move the needle. And the men and women that partner with us and that are on our staff, they not only want to see what problems they can solve, but they view emerging generations as people that they're called to serve. Oh, and it. they want to do it with laughter and they want to do it with joy and they want to take walks with kids and play baseball and listen to stories and color and teach them how to read. But ultimately they just want every kid, like this one kid to be able to text and say, why, why did you, you pick, pick me? me? Yeah. And I love that a year ago, the table was not full like this. No, it was not, it was pretty empty. <laughs> but uh, we've been blessed to have this amazing team of friends that are now serving with us. Hi, you all. Hi friends. Hey guys. Hey, how are you?